now you know see we are uh, here in a uh, institute uh, of chemical technology okay and uh, we uh, of course power is very important you know and we've talked uh, uh, endlessly on power you know how important it is and uh, starting from the photovoltaic cell to solar thermal uh, power nuclear power we've covered power uh, in many dimensions okay but i think it would be also very interesting if we could look at the applications of solar energy in 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 organic synthesis for example you know because organic chemistry is such a big uh, uh, area right i mean starting from pharmaceuticals to dyes to polymers you know everything is based on uh, uh, synthetic organic chemistry okay so uh, you know uh, we should know uh, that how exactly these molecules are being synthesized and whether there is a uh, opportunity uh, to do it in the future uh, with the help of solar energy so i will actually uh, take you through uh, uh, some of this you know in today's lecture okay and then we'll move on to the uh, next topic okay now uh, of course when we say organic synthesis uh, you know or or making molecules uh, there are uh, one is of course uh, most of the time you know you put these uh, raw materials into some solvent uh, you put some reagents cook them up you know it forms a product okay then you may have to distill up the solvent okay and recover your product you know from some other solvent or do a crystallization uh, whatever okay now so distillation of organic solvents you know in uh, uh, in 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 any kind of uh, uh, chemical uh, technology is extremely important you know it, um, the and the solvent need not be only water water of course uh, is uh, uh, very important when you are doing your reactions in water uh, but otherwise you could also be doing uh, reactions in organic solvent you know now so uh, you know and this uh, is such an easy thing to do relatively easy thing to do okay uh, that uh, uh, always see uh, if you can apply solar energy uh, in these kinds of applications okay so uh, for example you know we talked about the parabolic crop and the par parabolic dish okay so this is a parabolic dish concentrator it's not a big one okay it's a small uh, unit and uh, you can see there is a, a typical uh, distillation assembly okay this is your condenser and you are collecting distillate over here and this is the your it, inside this is a round bottom flask you know where you have got solvent okay and uh, uh, so the radiation is falling here and it gets focused as we said at a point right in the case of a parabola so the round bottom flask has been put at the focus uh, of this uh, uh, parabolic uh, uh, dish okay and so it gets very hot you know and uh, distillation happens okay and you can see uh, that uh, you know and this is done with uh, in a normal uh, terrace okay uh, this uh, distillation okay and uh, look at the boiling point Uh, some of them as you know are uh, fairly low boiling uh, solvents like hexane uh, ethyl acetate tetrahydrofuran okay uh, these are not so uh, uh, you know, high in boiling point but take for example dma dimethyl formamide you know it boils at 153 degree centigrade you know so it's not a small uh, uh, temperature you know uh, ethyl benzene about 136 degree centigrade and these also can be readily distilled you know in this assembly okay and uh, uh, what you have to do of course is that you you have to monitor the temperature of the round bottom flask you know and you can put in a, a thermocouple or you can have a, a some kind of a, 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 you know some other some other uh, probe okay and uh, you can monitor the temperature okay uh, uh, by a uh, by any uh, method okay? and you can see that 
typically you know it was uh, when when the sun was uh, like noon time uh, you could reach temperatures of around maximum was about 173 degrees centigrade you know and over a, a period of 3 hours uh, you could collect about 135 uh, ml of uh, dms okay obviously where the boiling point is less naturally uh, you will collect more you know because the uh, its uh, vapor pressure is much higher you know uh, in those cases okay and uh, so uh, so you know you can uh, uh, you you can do distillation now why i'm again in emphasizing this is that uh, when you are looking at applying uh, renewable energy resources look for where it is the easiest to apply you know don't look at where it is the hardest to apply you know? uh, and uh, uh, so in that sense uh, i would treat this as a, a low hanging fruit you know uh, which doesn't require uh, very very high technology okay but engineering is going to be very important because it is one thing uh, to distill uh, one liter of uh, solvent now if somebody says hey can you distill for me 2000 liters of solvent in uh, in 4 hours you know obviously it becomes a much more complicated problem okay and that is where most of these solar energy uh, 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 things will have a uh, some kind of a difficulty uh, which is scalability okay uh, otherwise you know at a small scale uh, you can uh, do it but don't forget uh, that's how for example solar photovoltaics started it started with a small little cell and then people were able to figure out how to put them in uh, series and uh, parallel and today you can generate you know power which you can supply to the grid okay so uh, or even these uh, you could uh, either think of making huge uh, parabolic dishes maybe uh, something like uh, 10 meters squared in uh, uh, or 10 uh, uh, 5 meter in uh, in diameter you know and so it will be large and you can put uh, uh, maybe uh, something like 1 kiloliter uh, vessel uh, under it okay and uh, you might be able to do it okay it's not a uh, not a big problem okay uh, so uh, but uh, uh, increasingly i hope that the engineers among you uh, will uh, will be able to see uh, where you can play a very important role okay uh, it need not be only in uh, generating new chemistry uh, but in scaling up uh, technologies you know that is uh, where there is a lot of opportunity for uh, doing very interesting things okay? now let me also take you now we we discussed so many different ways of storing uh, solar energy you know uh, mostly they were based on uh, inorganic systems you know like we uh, looked at many of those copper cycle and uh, si cycle the sulfur iodine uh, cycle and things like that okay and uh, also how to split water to make hydrogen and oxygen you know and those were all methods of uh, storage now let me uh, take you through uh, uh, well before i come to that you know again another example uh, of where you can use uh, solar thermal energy you know uh, by the way what you need to do is that the round bottom flask uh, you must coat it with black paint okay because then only it will absorb the radiation okay so you you need to for example it would be a great idea to make solar selective coatings uh, for some of our uh, 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 chemical uh, uh, glassware and things like that you know so that you can maximize the uh, temperature that you can achieve and minimize uh, reflection losses okay now this is another very interesting area of uh, where uh, solar thermal energy uh, can be used you know so I'll go one by one through several uh, examples. Now, what this molecule is basically the dimer of this, you know, and this is cyclopentadiene, okay? Five-membered ring, okay? And there are two uh, olefins, so uh, cyclopentadiene, okay? 
and this uh, exists uh, in the form of a dimer this is the dimer okay it's uh, basically through a uh, for those who know uh, it's through uh, what is known as a diels-alder reaction uh, which is a spontaneous uh, reaction of this and it forms this now this is a very inert uh, material you know uh, what is very interesting is that people had found out that if you heat this to about a temperature of 180 degrees centigrade or thereabout, you know, that uh, you can actually uh, crack it open and it can again form this. Okay, and this is a very very powerful chemical which you can use in uh, many different applications. Okay, so this is an and the, and the second thing is you know everything is known about the energetics of this process it is known like what is the free energy change and the enthalpy change that takes place uh, in this reaction the delta h is positive you know which means uh, you need uh, heat you know to uh, uh, to basically carry out this uh, transformation and also the free energy is positive means that after you have made this this is at a higher energy level okay over here so this is a very nice example of where solar energy is being used to actually carry out an organic transformation uphill in energy now remember uh, this is very important and a point to uh, uh, stress that Solar energy in these reactions uh, can play two types of role. One is that I'm pushing something uphill. So this is, I've made a more energetic product. You know? no, no different from if I, if I made oxygen and hydrogen from water and of the oxygen and hydrogen is at a higher energy than water. And that's why, you know, if I strike a match, you know, uh, the hydrogen and oxygen will immediately combine and reform water you know, because hydrogen and oxygen is at a much higher state of energy. You know. Similarly, you are here at a higher state of energy, you know, and uh, therefore I have effectively stored, you know, energy in the form of chemical energy. I could in principle reconvert this to this during night, you know, and I could get out the extra heat okay and i can use it for for different purposes okay i could do uh, uh, that or i could use it as a reagent and i'll show you uh, in the next slide how we do that okay now you can also see these pictures okay of uh, you know uh, the flask in which uh, this thing was taken and look how it's uh, dazzling over there you know because all of this radiation is uh, falling here and then uh, going and hitting this uh, uh, flask now you could also uh, do it by uh, an infrared uh, sensor you know and uh, so uh, you know this sensor uh, basically uh, uh, you you uh, it's been graded such that you from here from the color that you get you'll be able to read out what is the temperature. So for a, you, you can actually make out that this temperature is like this. So this temperature is around 175 to 190 degrees. So that's why this temperature has been mentioned. The surroundings are much colder because uh, the parabolic uh, 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 dish is only foc focusing at the, uh, at the, uh, in the flask, you know, and not over here, you know. So these are all cold even though the radiation is falling everywhere okay and so these will uh, uh, register a much lower temperature you know something like 60 70 degree uh, centigrade whereas this would be around 190 degree centigrade okay and uh, uh, when you're doing these experiments uh, of course you need to first fabricate a device you know you need to make a concentrator okay all of these were fabricated okay uh, in the laboratories but you can also buy them okay? and uh, and then you need to generate data like over what time period are you carrying out your study you know how much of the material did you charge how much of this, this did i charge you know 
uh, how much of uh, uh, this did I collect? Okay, and uh, what is the yield? You know, in terms of milliliter per hour. You know, and uh, you know you can work it out. Or I can also con uh, calculate the yield in terms of what is the energy uh, that I require to reach this state, and how much insulation would fell on uh, this uh, parabolic dish over one and a half hours. You know, and then I can uh, uh, look at you know what is the uh, efficiency of uh, uh, converting the solar energy into uh, chemical energy. Okay, now. Uh, coming back to the hill, there are two things that you can use the solar energy for. One is that there are many reactions, you know, which are thermodynamically spontaneous. In other words, it doesn't look like this. It will come here. In other words, the products are more stable than the uh, starting material. So then uh, the products will be at a lower energy. Okay. And, but, I need an activation energy to carry out the reaction. Okay? As we know, most reactions in chemistry uh, require an activation energy. So you can use solar energy to provide you the activation energy to even carry out reactions which are otherwise thermodynamically spontaneous. Or, as in this case, you can actually carry out a non-spontaneous reaction. Okay. Is the difference between the two clear to you? A spontaneous and a non-spontaneous reaction and activation energy? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Now, now let's take, for example, you know, uh, you start with your uh, that dicyclopentadiene and you cracked it and you made cyclopentadiene. Now, it's amazing. I mean, if you make this, from here, you know, I I can make all kinds of compounds, okay. And uh, these are not necessarily very uh, energetically uh, uh, demanding steps, you know. They require, of course, good chemistry, uh, but not necessarily always very energy demanding. So you can, for example, you can make a nucleoside, you know. You can make a natural product, you know. Uh, you can make a insecticide. You can make an antifungal agent, okay? You can make metallocene catalyst, okay? All kinds of things uh, can be made starting with this. So this is what is meant by the chemical footprint. That if, let's say, I took dicyclopentadiene and then I heated it with a Bunsen burner, you know, burning natural gas, and then I calculated that how much energy did I require in total to make these compounds, okay? Versus that I carry out my first step, you know, of first cracking this and making this with solar energy, and then uh, I calculate the rest of the carbon footprint, you know. So this would be an ideal way to try and reduce the carbon footprint uh, in synthesis. Is that clear? How you can reduce carbon footprint? You don't have to do everything with solar energy. You do that part which uh, is easy to do, you know, like I showed you, it's quite easy, you know, to, uh, to put a reactor in the middle and uh, just uh, heat it. Uh, it's, these are not thermally temperature sensitive compounds. I heat it, I crack it, I get cyclopentadiene and that's it. You know, all I need to do is on the other side, I might have to have some kind of a cooling arrangement uh, so that this can be kept cold. You know, otherwise it will again revert to this uh, molecule. Okay, so I just have to make sure that it can be kept uh, uh, stable. Okay, uh, now, uh, uh, so right now what I showed you were two examples of where uh, we took solar energy and we then converted it into thermal energy. Okay, and carried out some organic, uh, useful organic. Uh, uh, processes. One is the simple operation of distillation, okay, and the second is uh, a chemical process where uh, dicyclopentadiene was cracked to cyclopentadiene. And you can uh, look at, you know, what are all the various kinds of 
uh, organic processes which you might be able to apply this to okay now i know that you all are students of uh, mtech green tech you know and uh, uh, your background is uh, pharmaceutical or mechanical engineering or civil engineering uh, some are chemical engineers of course uh, you know so that that's fine but what you should do is uh, you should always talk to other people who may be knowledgeable in their subject and you can say hey i have made a device you know i have made this device okay and uh, i'm trying to apply it okay uh, and uh, can you suggest to me some reaction which uh, we might be able to do okay and so you can interact with other people and really generate ideas you know and that is the best way you know in in which to do things you know you make a device you say i fabricated a a very nice solar uh, device and if you don't know how to fabricate go and talk to mechanical engineers you know who are good at these kinds of things you know and tell them that i i want to uh, uh, fabricate this can you help me to design it you know get all the uh, sensors etc uh, all in place and then you go and talk to uh, uh, technologists who might be able to tell you they might say oh yeah i i know uh, that this would be a very useful transformation to look at and that's how you can uh, engage yourself in uh, this kind of work you know don't think that you have to know everything starting from uh, el uh, electrical engineering to mechanical engineering to civil engineering to chemistry to physics you know nobody has that kind of a breadth of knowledge you know? but you can always go and consult others and pick up what you don't know now up till now as i said what we did except for uh, uh, when we talked about the solar photovoltaic where uh, the the silicon uh, solar cell is actually making use of the photons in your sunlight okay it is it is not the thermal energy okay it is making use of the light energy the photons okay? now this is the typical electromagnetic spectrum uh, as you will see it uh, at sea level you know so this is not very different from uh, the spectrum that we have discussed earlier on okay and uh, so just imagine uh, how important it is and the kinds of uh, uh, great things that are uh, uh, being done you know so uh, now uh, photovoltaic cell that entire solar thing is all about uh, taking light you know of uh, a wavelength which is lower or a frequency which is higher than uh, or a wavelength which is shorter than uh, 600 nanometers you know so this part okay and that's your entire solar photovoltaics you know over here now what else have we learned we learned about photosynthesis you know there's nothing uh, uh, more important than that you know in terms of our survival okay and what are we doing there we are taking light which is in this range you know between 600 and 700 nanometer okay and uh, we are uh, able to convert uh, uh, water into uh, oxygen and we generate the these molecules in an energetic form atp and nadph as we discussed and so these are getting generated in your uh, 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 you know photosystems 1 and 2 with evolution of oxygen and then after it it these are the things which are powering your calvin cycle as we discussed and that's how you make glucose and uh, uh lipoic acid then and, and everything uh, there on okay so uh, again uh, it's all based on photons it's not thermal energy huh? it is the photon energy the actual light and then uh, look at us you know or any living being uh, our ability to uh, see you know we, uh, our eyes that they can see what is happening it is just that this compound 11 cis retinal right 
is basically in the presence of light getting converted into the trans form it is going to 11 trans retinol okay and uh, and what is doing this thing i can take because you know we can see red light green light blue light you know so it has got an ability to take all of the visible radiation and uh, across the entire visible radiation uh, you know it can carry out this kind of a transformation of course you know there are some people who will be who will have greater sensitivity towards red or uh, some people will be color blind uh, some people can cannot see some colors you know so those are all there but typically the majority of us can see all the colors you know so effectively we are really talking about uh, you know harnessing the photons over here that's what falls into your eye and creates the sensation of sight but otherwise it is nothing more than a photochemical process and so is this is just a photochemical process being carried out by an enzyme okay uh, now people you know when they realize that after all light can actually do chemistry you know with photons uh, that there was a lot of interest and that interest is not today that interest has been there maybe even 300 400 years you know that people have started looking at uh, uh, how to use uh, uh, solar energy now one of the people who has made uh, massive contributions you know is uh, in fact it was at one time in the early part of the 20th century uh, it was the italian you know, uh, who probably did some of the finest work and this person siamisian okay he is uh, you can call, call him as uh, maybe the father of uh, 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 photochemistry artificial photochemistry not what nature does i'm not talking about um, the sensation of sight or uh, plants making uh, oxygen and food okay i'm talking about doing it chemically okay and uh, he uh, actually took this uh, 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 particular uh, uh, natural product is known as carbon okay this compound and what he found is that sunlight uh, uh, does an amazing transformation you know uh, what is the transformation it is doing okay so what happens is that these were the people who really for the first time who found that there are certain transformations which only take place with light if you heat it this transformation will not take place but it will take place with light and then there are transformations which will take place with heat and will not take place with light you know so that's also very nice and then uh, that gave rise to what is known as selection rule you know? that there are certain rules of the kinds of synthesis that is possible with the help of sunlight and the kinds that are possible with thermal energy okay now this particular reaction is known as a 2 plus 2 reaction okay what is 2 plus 2 this is basically two pi electrons okay a double bond has two pi electrons and this double bond also has two pi electrons okay all it does is it does a beautiful joining up it connects this point with this point and it connects this point with this point it it just you know this is that six membered ring okay and it is just connected up you know it is connected up uh, uh, this stuff you know and it it it's made another uh, natural product and purely with sunlight okay and he is the one in 1912 you know he published a paper in science where he envisioned the future for organic chemistry uh, with uh, sunlight you know and uh, since the last uh, i will say 100 110 years you know people have been at it and they're constantly trying to expand this vision of the various kinds of reactions uh, that you can do uh, with the help of sunlight this is uh, uh, again 
uh, another example all right of a uh, of a reaction with uh, uh, with light right uh, now again very similar only difference is that in the other one there was a c double bond c and a c double bond c and you were forming a bond here you are having a c double bond rho so one oxygen is going and binding here and the carbon is going and forming a bond here and you have generated a four membered ring okay now because uh, this molecule is uh, uh, is different in the two carbons you know so i can get two isomers all right and uh, so you know th that would be one of the complexities uh, in some of these reactions that you may not necessarily get selectivity and look when this person did this 1909 you know uh, paterno and it's after him you know that this uh, reaction is called now i will send you also this particular uh, uh, paper which was published in journal of chemical education you know it shows uh, they have made a beautiful laboratory uh, demonstration unit you know uh, for uh, uh, this paterno uh, 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 buki reaction okay so you can you can read it up okay? and it could be that some of you actually could make presentations on making actually laboratory demonstrations of reactions or something with uh, sunlight you know uh, that also would be quite interesting to uh, to do i mean uh, that's one of the things and uh, he, he does this uh, entire chemistry with uh, with an led okay 365 nanometer led you know and uh, so you know yet another example now uh, now this is uh, another uh, and and let me tell you there's a huge amount of work taking place today uh, on this okay uh, we as i said we've discussed uh, different ways uh, of storing solar energy uh, this was first published around i think around 1984 you know and uh, what they have shown again similar to the previous one that uh, you can do with the help of light uh, this 2 plus 2 reaction so what are you doing is forming one bond here and another bond here so you just converted it to this this molecule is known as norbornadiene okay and this molecule is known as quadricyclic okay and the interesting thing is that just like in the case of that cyclopentadiene you know with the help of a catalyst you can go back to this and it releases a lot of energy you know it it's got an energy of 22.8 kilocalorie per mole okay so uh, you can generate a good amount of thermal energy you know through uh, uh, through this and you can do it at, in the dark at night now the problem uh, with this reaction as well as to some extent with this reaction is that you know when they did it originally in 1984 uh, what happened was that um, it, it it really uh, took place more with uh, what i will call ultraviolet radiation you know maybe a wavelength of around 350 uh, nanometer not exactly uh, visible radiation visible radiation typically uh, we'll start with about say around 400 nanometers okay uh, so uh, so it you can see like this is the spectrum okay so they are doing all these reactions with uh, some uh, wavelength around here and where the solar insulation is very low okay it's only after 400 nanometer that is rises steeply okay so while those are great reactions you know uh, the problem is that uh, you actually cannot use solar energy because the uh, solar uh, uv component in uh, the solar spectrum is uh, very very low so uh, there is a huge amount of work uh, that is taking place more or less you know uh, following the same methodology but what they are doing is they are altering the molecule slightly okay like they put in some substituents you know you can see this part is the same 
as this, except that they put in some substituents. What this does is that now the molecule starts absorbing sunlight. Okay, and you can do exactly the same chemistry, but now you can do it with sunlight. So uh, this is an area, you know, of research for those of you who are uh, interested in uh, in taking up research in the future. That uh, you know, take some of these ideas and see how to make them practical, you know, or how to make them relevant to use of solar energy. It is not enough to say that I've carried out a photochemical transformation. I must be able to do it with the help of sunlight. Okay, and that's what these people have been able to do. I mean, I've given the reference for those who might want to go and uh, read it up. Now, there's a lot of work going on not just in developing the molecules, but in actually developing the entire system of how exactly you will store, how it, the energy will be released, at what scale can you do it, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, but th this is, uh, when, when I say that, uh, uh, you know, look for good problems in uh, renewable energy, uh, this would be one such example of a very good problem to look at. Okay, now let me uh, uh, take you uh, to, uh, you know, where people and, and the Germans have done uh, remarkable work uh, in, in this. The Germans have been able to think quite big, you know, and this is what I've shown you here are your parabolic troughs. You remember the parabolic trough, which focuses at a line. So this is your line. It's like a tube over here, okay? And uh, they've got these massive troughs, you know, which they've set up in, in Germany. And uh, not just one, they have several of these, okay? So say, let's say I feed some uh, reactants uh, over here. It goes to my, uh, or it's coming from here, okay? And it is uh, going this way. Uh, it may then enter into the next uh, uh, trough and, and I can continue, you know. And uh, so I can uh, uh, do things by connecting up many of these troughs in uh, series, you know. And, uh, and actually, uh, uh, let me also tell you that uh, they are carrying out these reactions with 32, 32 sun radiation. In other words, the parabolic trough is such that the light which is falling on the trough the, and what is falling on this tube, what is falling on this tube is 30 ti 32 times more intense than this. Okay, so that is why it's called 32 suns. Right? So you can have a huge light flux. Okay? Lots of uh, light energy is there and so the reactions can take place quite fast you know, because of that. Now, there's one problem that, uh, you know, uh, what happens is that many of the reactions that these people were looking at uh, are good, but those reactions are also sometimes uh, uh, temperature sensitive. You know? Now, when let's say the light is coming over here from the parabolic trough to this tube, everything is coming. The infrared radiation is coming. The visible radiation is coming. And if I don't remove my infrared radiation, then my tube can become extremely hot, you know. And in some of the reactions, what you require is cold light. You know, you require the photons, but you don't require the thermal energy, okay. So you may have to uh, have some kind of a cooling system, maybe a jacketed uh, a vessel or something, you know, so that you can extract the surplus heat. Okay. Otherwise, you know, your uh, uh, your reactions might go haywire. Now, look at this. You know, they have done reactions at something like maximum 120 liter scale. Okay. So you are almost like going into industrial production. And especially, you know, when you're talking about solar energy, uh, 
maybe you should select uh, reaction you know which are uh, or products which are to begin with uh, high price high value and maybe low volume you, know? you don't have to necessarily go into uh, products which are millions of tons in production maybe they are produced in uh, uh, one ton scale you know or, or or something like that or 10 ton scale so if i can do uh, say if i can get about 40 50 kg in a day you know at at this scale i mean i can comfortably you know make several tons of products over a year you know? it's not a problem so uh, you know keep this in mind so i will just read out you know because it's quite nice uh, and the person who has done it is his name is olga miller okay the loop is based on a line focusing parabolic crop so that's why what you have been taught now you know what is the line focus okay line focusing parabolic crop collector and comprises a uh, whatever helium and module you know that's basically what this crop is and feeding equipment so this is all feeding equipment okay and what are those storage vessels pumps heat exchanger and because they have to cool it you know gas fitting etc the latter placed nearby in a separated shed this reactor type requires direct sunlight since it can only concentrate the direct part of the global radiation you remember we said diffuse radiation cannot be concentrated it's only direct uh, sunlight which is coming like a beam you know only that can be concentrated so obviously you know these experiments are best set up in places where the direct sunlight is component is good you know not in places where you have a hazy atmosphere and most of the sunlight is scattered okay so then it won't work the collector enables a geometric concentration factor corresponding to about 32 sun and you know you can go back to uh, all those equations that we had talked about earlier but its efficiency is reduced in practice due to optical losses the mirror elements each 1 meter square eight elements per crop so these are the mirrors you know uh, all the mirrors uh, which this parabolic crop uh, is based on are made of silver coated glass and follow the sun by a three dimensional tracking system on two axes so you remember we talked about photovoltaic cells etc keeping them at a constant alignment okay uh, keeping in mind the latitude and things like that here uh, they are actually tracking the sun so it is moving in all in both axes okay and so that every time uh, this unit is perfectly aligned to the sun so that you always maximize the solar intensity which is followed of course there is a penalty because you would require motors etc to move things you know obviously that will also cost you energy and the given storage vessel and feed equipment allow experiments on 35 to 120 meter scale okay and uh, and this is what is called you know propis is the name uh, parabolic uh, organic photochemical synthesis okay now what uh, we have also seen uh, is that uh, you know we, we said no, that uh, solar radiation uh, really uh, is uh, kind of gets maximized more around 400 uh, here is 300 you know there's not uh, much of uh, intensity you know, the intensity is very low okay uh, it's only uh, somewhere here that it starts picking up well now what these people have done is that they have found organic reactions which operate you know in different kinds of wavelengths of radiation you know so there is one uh, which is like say between something like 350 to uh, 450 nanometer you know another one from 500 to 600 nanometer another from 600 to 700 nanometer okay so they have worked out which reactions will take place with particular wavelengths of the solar spectrum okay? and uh, accordingly they have designed their reactions so we'll read out again while passing through the atmosphere the solar photon stream 
is changed in intensity and spectral distribution. Furthermore, the quality of the direct sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface is strongly dependent on the geographic location. We have read about, we have learned about the the uh, declination angle, the latitude, and and their importance. For Cologne, Germany, figure two shows the calculated molar spectral direct solar irradiance. So they have worked out the solar irradiance in Cologne. Okay, together with the extraterrestrial irradiance uh, nine. It is important to note that not all organic reactions, photoreactions known from the laboratory are suitable for solar chemical application. For example, no solar photons in the photochemically important region below 300 nanometer are detectable on the Earth's surface. The UV component is very low. Additionally, only the region up to the threshold wavelength of 700 nanometer is energetically suitable to induce structural changes. So photochemical reactions really don't take place with infrared radiation. You know? So this part is you are going towards the near infrared and infrared. You know, there, there's very few photochemical reactions that will take place over here. Now, obviously, that itself will open up a new possible area of research. That is, how can I convert radiation in these regions into higher frequency radiation? Is it possible to do by some means? I mean, that will be brilliant if somebody can achieve it. For our studies, we have selected photoacylation involving quinones and disensitized photooxygenations. Both types of reactions match nicely with the solar spectrum. So that's part of design. You first see what is your solar spectrum like, where you want to put up your plant. Okay? And then you design, you, you decide which particular reaction you might want to study. Okay. Now, let's uh, uh, take, uh, and these are very important organic reactions. Okay? Like this reaction is known as a photoacylation reaction. The reaction as such was discovered in 1891 by this person, Klinger, you know, and uh, but what these people have done is that they have done it in that Prophys uh, reactor and not bad, 500 gram scale. Okay. 500 grams is not a bad scale to carry out a reaction. I mean, they could have easily done it, you know, uh, uh, at a tenfold higher uh, scale, which is uh, maybe at a five kg scale. Is not a problem. I mean, I just have to replicate the number of crops, etc., uh, that I have to put in. Okay. So let's again read what he says. Due to their absorption at wavelengths above 350 nanometer, quinones are excellent substrate for solar chemical application. These are quinones. Okay. This is called a quinone structure. Thus, we have chosen the photochemical reactions between a quinone and an aldehyde. This is aldehyde, okay, uh, as a mild and efficient alternative to thermal Friedel-Crafts acylations or Fry's rearrangement. These are all thermal uh, processes by which you can also carry out the reaction. But they wanted to do it with solar energy. This photoacylation was discovered in 1891 by Klinger, who exposed the starting materials to natural sunlight over long periods of time. So he, they left it. For a long time and, and they did the reaction. To find optimal reaction conditions for our modern outdoor approach, we studied the photoisolation in detail with artificial light. So what you can do is, while you are, you might have an intention of using solar energy, you do experiments in the laboratory first. You can even use, uh, you know, there are simulated lamps which are available, lamps which simulate solar radiation. You can buy them. And you can do those. A major disadvantage of the laboratory protocol was the usage of toxic solvents, benzene or acetonitride. Okay. So what they did was they also replaced these solvents with more non-toxic solvents like tertiary butanol okay, and acetone. So this is what they did. You know, they, they used, they did also a substitution of solvent. Okay. 
for our model reaction between 1,4 naphthaquinone and butyraldehyde, the photo product 3 was obtained in an isolated yield of 84%. Very good. You know, with these optimized reaction conditions, the photo photoacylation of the 1 2 pair uh, was performed on a 500 gram scale use, using the Propis plant. Okay, three troughs equal to 24 meters squared total parabolic trough area. Okay, this parabolic trough total area was 24 meters squared over which the solar radiation was falling. Okay, and due to the difficulty of handling pure tertiary butanol. A 3 to 1 mixture with acetone was used instead. Anyway, that's another uh, change that they uh, made, you know. And look, they've done the entire reaction with solar energy at a 500 gram, gram scale, not microgram scale. You know. And uh, for those who uh, are interested, you know, uh, effectively what happens is that these quinones, you know, absorb light, okay. And then uh, what happens is that it can form this carbonyl. Uh, you can have a transition where it forms the oxygen radical. Okay? This oxygen radical can pick up a hydrogen from your aldehyde. So it will become OH. Okay? And now this will become a carbon radical, which will go and attack this point. Okay? And so I'll get this. Okay? And then all I do is that I can do a tautomerization here, you know, and uh, so effectively, uh, you know, the tautomerization will give you an aromatic structure. So that will be the driving force, and so it will become OH, and this will become a double bond. So it will become aromatic. So ultimately, you end up with this compound. Okay, and look at the beauty. It's a, uh, it, it's a. Uh, there is no side product. You know. There's no uh, nothing. You know, you just. Uh, generate your actual uh, reaction. Now, uh, and, and then uh, uh, he, he gives some details. And this is also very important. So if you are doing such studies, don't just do it on one day. You know, you must do it successively on many days and collect data. Because, you know, you'll find, like, for example, they found that on one day, uh, the sunlight was very good. You know, they got about uh, a peak sunlight of about 850 uh, watt per meter squared, you know, which is what we we'll get in Rajasthan, for example. You know. But on other days, you know, it was cloudy, you know, and they didn't get much light. So they didn't get very good conversion on those days. You know. And he says the illumination took place during 20 and 22 August 1996 for a total illumination time of 24 hours. As is not untypical for the location and time of the year, the weather conditions were varying and only the first day was optimal for reaching a high conversion. This becomes apparent when comparing the direct normal irradiance for the three day period. Okay? And the first day was when they got maximum uh, solar insulation. At the end of the experiment, complete conversion was achieved and a yield of 90% of three was determined via gas chromatography. During the experimental phase, the three troughs of the Propis plant collected almost 300 mole photons uh, in the important absorption region of this. And of these, 240 moles were received during the first day alone. So 240 moles they took. And if we knew that how much of the actual material did they convert, we would know, you know that how many moles okay, of uh, compound they had. You know? And from that, you know, you would be able to work out the efficiency of use of the solar energy. Okay, is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, now let me also uh, show you uh, another type of uh, reactions, you know, uh, which have become uh, uh, extremely important, okay? And these are known as photo oxygenation reactions. Because you know, there's nothing better if I can use sunlight and oxygen and carry off my uh, or air and carry off my reaction. There's nothing better than that. Okay, and uh, I'll show you some uh, really interesting uh, uh, reactions have been carried out. 
now let us start understanding okay uh, some properties okay which are important to understand uh, what exactly happens in the reaction okay uh, the reaction is being carried out with uh, using oxygen okay and they also use something known as a sensitizer a sensitizer is like a dye molecule which is absorbing your solar radiation you know? so the molecule this the actual organic molecules which are trying to react they may not be the ones which are uh, absorbing the light okay the light is being absorbed by a dye a sensitizer okay now this dye goes into an excited state which we call let's say as singlet sensitizer okay and it can also in interconvert and form a triplet sensitizer you know so this is these are the two excited states of this particular dye okay? now what this dye will do you know, is that follow this type 2 this particular uh, uh, reaction is that the dye will react with oxygen regular oxygen okay? and it will form what is known as singlet oxygen okay so let us try and understand what is triplet oxygen and singlet oxygen okay? many of you already know it some of you may not know it okay now o2 molecule has this molecular orbital structure okay? and uh, uh, for those who know a little bit of uh, uh, chemical bonding uh, what you know is that in the oxygen molecule uh, the anti bonding orbitals at the highest occupied orbitals you know so there are two anti bonding orbitals pi uh, x and pi y and there are two of these electrons one goes into the x orbital and one goes into the pi or y orbital because of what is known as hund's law the maximum multiplicity okay now when what this sensitizer this dye did after it absorbed the light okay and it get got converted into this form which is what the triplet the triplet sensitizer form okay is that it just collides with the oxygen and transfers its energy to the oxygen okay it's just a band you know and and it is transferred the energy now when the energy is transformed that energy is sufficient you know for this electron to now pair up with this electron okay and it becomes the singlet state of oxygen which is at a higher energy this state is at a higher energy than this state okay this is the stable form of oxygen this is the unstable form of o2 and now this singlet oxygen is known as singlet because there is uh, uh, no unpaired electron okay and this is known as triplet because there are two unpaired electron okay so uh, so this oxygen can now react with my organic compound and it can give you oxygenated products okay so for example you know you can see over here right there is let's say this is my substrate okay? this is my substrate and this singlet oxygen is now reacting with this okay and it's forming initially a weak kind of an adduct okay? it's just forming an adduct and later on it will transform into a bond okay now let us see how uh, those people the propis uh, reactor guys you know how they use this chemistry to carry out a very very important transformation this compound here is rose oxide okay and rose oxide is one of the most important uh, fragrances uh, and uh, it's it's used you know in a lot of uh, uh, like in a lot of food stuff you know they will put uh, the essence of rose okay uh, that's what uh, rose oxide is this stuff now they start with a natural compound citronellol okay this is citronellol okay and basically by this chemistry that i am showing you i am not showing you all the details 
you know uh, what happens is that it gets converted through this photo oxygenation process into two compounds this is one and this is the other how is it happening basically the oxygen goes and attacks this double bond you know so this uh, adduct that i'm showing you this is that double bond okay on which the singlet oxygen is going in sitting now after that what happens is that i can end up you know getting an oxygenation at two different places i'm not going to the mechanism of this okay uh, and uh, effectively they end up forming these two isomers 45% and 55% okay now this particular isomer you know is the one which can be converted into rose oxide how does it happen this oxygen goes and basically binds over here to this carbon so now let's look at it one sorry one two three four five and with the oxygen six so it will form a six membered ring you can see one two three four five six this is a six membered ring okay and this is your methyl this methyl okay? then this double bond when this goes and attacks here this double bond shifts here okay and what will happen is that this oh gets kicked off as a oh minus okay so effectively what i ended up doing you know is that i've got two methyls and now i've got my double bond this is my double bond and this is connected to this particular ring so this is my rose oxide which i made from here entirely with solar energy okay and so let's read it to be here and this reaction by the way uh, this particular reaction is known as the shenkin uh, reaction the photo oxygenated photosensitized oxygenation of citronellol was studied as a second example of the solar chemical synthesis concept this reaction is currently performed industrially on a greater than 100 ton per annum scale okay by a company in germany using artificial light sources so they are trying to replace artificial light sources with solar energy subsequent reduction and acid mediated cyclization of the regio isomer 5b gives the important fragrance rose oxide so this is an acid catalyzed reaction okay due to its industrial importance this photo reaction has become a prototype for solar photochemical comparison study for the solar reactions in the protis blue the sensitizer rose bengal was selected so that is the sensitizer you know this is the one that is actually absorbing the light was selected since it shows a favorable absorption of up to 600 nanometer in the solar spectrum they are trying to maximize the absorption of sunlight by the sensitizer you know and this sensitizer gives you maximum absorption of the sunlight okay the solvent methanol from the industrial process was replaced by the less hazardous isopropanol anyway that's not so important that is your isopropanol here you know but effectively what they have shown is that you can actually replace artificial sources of light you know and there are industrial processes based on light you can actually carry them out outside in the sun okay now uh, let's again read what he says the first experiment was performed on 11th august 1997 with only one crop and the reactor was loaded with a solution of uh, 5.8 liters 31.8 mol of citronellol okay 5.8 liters and 20 gram of rose bengal in 40 liter of isopropanol upon illumination citronellol was rapidly consumed and after ca 3 hours an almost quantitative conversion of 4 was achieved so this got converted into b gc analysis performed after reduction of the corresponding sample with sodium sulfide okay 
furthermore proved the high purity of the regio isomeric photo products which were formed in a ratio of ca 45 to 55 ratio the latter finding is in good agreement with the reported isolated yield ratio of 35 to 60 from the laboratory experiments with artificial light so they got more or less comparable results during the experimental period the reactor collected 47.1 mole of photons between 500 to 600 nanometers okay and 47.1 mole in the second run on 12 september all four troughs were used giving a total aperture of 32 meter square in addition the experiment was scaled up to 43.9 mole okay of citronellol and 36 g of rose bengal and 72 whatever it's isopropanol and here you know they uh, collected about 133.4 mole of photons in the range of 500 to uh, 600 nanometer okay and uh, so effectively you know they are you can see like 31.8 mole of this product they have uh, starting material they have taken in the first experiment they had 47 mole of photons so you know it's 31 by 47 Uh, you are talking about something like uh, 70% uh, uh, kind of quantum efficiency yeah. that means 70% of the photons were actually put to good use you know 60 70% okay. so that's a tremendous uh, 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 achievement you know in my uh, opinion okay and for those of you when you are doing your studies you have to collect all this data insulation solar insulation aperture area uh, focal point you know everything okay atmospheric conditions atmospheric temperature you know and uh, th that's how you will uh, basically optimize your reaction now what people have subsequently gone and done okay and this is where a lot of engineering is coming in is uh, you know what they are doing it's very smart see we saw that uh, like for example in this particular reaction with rose bengal okay this one this is the solar spectrum and they are using only this okay the rest of it is not useful but there are certain materials known which are phosphors you know phosphorescent compounds so i can convert my shorter wavelength radiation in a way that i also convert them into photons of this wavelength you know that's what a phosphor is i uh, kind of illuminate it with higher frequency radiation and it gets converted into a lower frequency uh, light luminescent light you know so what i can do this this way is that this part of my radiation which i could not have otherwise used now i can use you know it all gets converted into this particular range and likewise if i were carrying out a reaction here i can use a suitable phosphor you know which will convert all of this radiation also into this particular wavelength range so that way i can maximize the utilization of my photon in sunlight is it clear okay how you maximize the uh, amount of photons uh, useful photons did you understand you understood or not yes sir okay okay so just by the process of luminescence okay so uh, uh, so what these people have done is that firstly they have made uh, of course these reactions are done at a very small scale okay and but this paper is published in an extremely prestigious uh, journal okay why because it is telling you a new concept okay? and after that i'm sure other people will Uh, you know scale it up they will uh, do it in the ton scale but what these people have done 
is that they have made certain capillaries, okay, which are capillaries made with transparent plastic, okay, like PMMA, polymethyl metacrylate, okay, and these are capillaries, and what? So they have made micro reactors, you know. So this is like a micro reactor. Now what they have further done is that they have coated, you know, these capillaries with suitable phosphorescent material, so that all of the sunlight can get converted into either red or blue or green light. Okay, exactly the kind of wavelength, you know, which I want. You know, so they are basically trying to match. You know, so they are trying to convert the sunlight into that particular band. Okay, so th that's what they've done. They have also been able to scale it up. Scale it up means not a very large scale, but from something like starting with 177 microliter, uh, they could go up to about 1.6 milliliter, you know, which is not bad. You know, they have scaled it up uh, uh, quite well. Uh, and, uh, you know, you might be able to in future do this uh, in a liter scale, kg scale, you know, and later on maybe in a ton scale. So what are they doing? So this uh, uh, this step is uh, depending on what I put, uh, it will absorb the radiation and get converted into the light, which is suitable for my reaction. Now then, what he has done is that they have identified reactions which will take place photochemically with that kind of light. Like for he says red, okay, means this particular reaction was done in this reactor. Okay? Then he says over here green. Okay? So these two reactions were done in this one. And blue, okay? these two reactions he has done over here. That, that's, so he, he has tailored you know, uh, the particular reactor you know, by beautifully uh, by basically coating it with a phosphorescent material. And maximizing the useful photons. Okay, and look at the reactions that is carried out. A wide variety of reactions. Like for example, uh, this is known as boronic assay. You know, and they have been able to convert it into phenol. It could become a future uh, technology. You know, it's a marvelous reaction. Okay, uh, they have carried out an oxidation of methane. Okay, over here. You know, they have uh, carried out an oxidation of benzyl amine. Okay, they have uh, made this. This is an extremely important industrial compound. Okay, uh, they have carried out uh, an oxidation of a terpene. Okay, and uh, they have done an adylation. They have they have actually inserted an organic, uh, an aromatic compound into this molecule. Okay, so wide variety of reactions. And each of these reactions is, is done with a very good uh, uh, kind of yield, you know. It's, it's not as if they, uh, they don't get a good conversion. They get a good conversion. Only thing is that they have to now scale it up, you know, uh, to very, very large scale reactors. Now, also because these are micro reactors, you know, the heat dissipation problem is a lot less. Because it's capillary reaction, you know, so so the heat exchange uh, with the surroundings is uh, is uh, much better, you know, in this particular thing. So you know, these guys have taken the knowledge from people like Olgo Miller, you know, and now they have basically uh, come up with new designs. And I would not be surprised if in ten years' time, you know, some of these things at least become. Technology. Uh, those of you who are in, uh, uh, you know, pharma, uh, 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 you know, you'll find this uh, uh, quite uh, interesting. Uh, you know that uh, I showed you the, uh, the the kind of reactions that they have done here. Okay. Now they've used this red one. Okay. This red uh, micro reactor, uh, and it's called the capillary based luminescent solar concentrator photo micro reactor okay uh, so this one 
and look they have carried out a very very important reaction they have made you know this particular compound artemisinin you know is probably the most popular now anti malarial drug okay and and they did it uh, outside you know using solar energy okay and uh, so what they do is uh, i don't want to go through the uh, the reaction but it is based on this uh, photo oxygenation you know you can see there is an oxygen uh, over here okay and uh, effectively you know that oxygen uh, comes here like uh, i shown you the uh, in the mechanism okay and later on uh, you know they they convert into this i don't want you to go into the mechanistic details although i you'll be able to work it out uh, from whatever i have given you uh, already you know now uh, let's read out what it says methylene blue catalyzed photo oxidation of dihydro artemisinin uh, mesenic acid under natural sunlight irradiation in a red lscpf okay uh, so uh, the experiments were performed in the max planck institute for colloids and interfaces of potsdam germany on the 26th and 29th of june 2018 under different sky conditions cloudy on the first day and sunny in the second day so you know i mean there were uh, 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 now then he says the different irradiance received by the reactor resulted in vastly different solar productivity but with similar yields thanks to the reaction control system so what they have done also is something very interesting if they put in a sensor so that suppose my let's say my insulation my solar insulation is low then they pass the uh, liquid you know at a at a slower rate okay and if the radiation is high then they increase the flow rate and that is automatically controlled by sensing the radiation uh, which they are getting okay so what is says like 26 june okay you can see that the actual radiation this is the radiation was quite poor you know it was about uh, um, what uh, uh, mostly around something like 700 800 uh, watt per meter squared you know lux okay and over here uh, on the next day uh, the radiation was much better okay so what they're saying is obviously when the radiation is more you know they could flow it more and they ended up getting more product right and so uh, here uh, they could probably get a 9.9 millimole per meter square per hour you know uh, that was the flow rate okay and here it was 21.2 but what is so they 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 just adjusting the flow rate depending on the uh, 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 light that is falling okay but the whatever light is falling is doing a very good job you know and it is not making much of a difference in terms of the yield the yield with respect to the amount that they actually passed okay so 69 74 78 69 78 76 you know so they they were able to keep the yield constant of course the productivity was much higher when there was more light which was falling because the flow rates were higher and this is the kind of you know you know design of experiments and parameters that you have to monitor this is how you will design as everyone understood what they did all clear yes sir okay okay now you know in all of these these compounds many of these compounds as i told you uh, are they are you 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 carry out the reaction with light but if there is too much of heat you know then the heat can actually cause a problem okay not necessarily in the micro reactors but certainly in these ones you know uh, in 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 this particular case because these tubes get very hot 
no? and again you will then require cooling and things like that no? so another approach an important thing to look at in this solar energy uh, application is if there are certain applications where both the light and the heat from the solar radiation are both beneficial nothing like it then i don't have to remove the heat you know the heat is beneficial you know so uh, you know i i'll just try and uh, illustrate uh, with a with a couple of examples of where light and heat are both beneficial can anyone suggest anything anything that you know where light and heat can both be beneficial anything okay now uh, let me uh, uh now remember another thing you know uh, as i have been uh, stressing it's all wonderful you know you can make micro reactors is that everything then that should be done because it has a huge uh, application in uh, in industrial processing you know? but there are many applications uh, which are again like low hanging fruits you know uh, which uh, which is easy to do like for example uh, you know many times the water that we drink okay tends to be contaminated with uh, bacteria it can have coliforms okay and uh, so one of the and uh, biggest problems is people end up getting diarrhea and things like that from the water that they drink there's nothing else necessarily wrong with the water uh, except for the fact that it might have germs in it okay now germs as we know uh, can be killed uh, both by uh, uh, uv light you know there are many water filters where uh, which operate on a uv Uh, lamp, you, know, you can you can buy those. Okay, and we also know that if you boil water, uh, why do we boil water to kill all the germs, right? Uh, so higher temperatures, like if you can reach a temperature of around say 70, 75 degrees centigrade, you know, uh, is quite good uh, for uh, for disinfection. And in fact, any temperature rise is uh, helpful, you know, in uh, in kind of reducing the Uh, the bacteria you know you can kill them okay so light is useful heat is also useful okay so this technology was initially uh, developed if i'm not mistaken in peru you know and later on it was in switzerland you know the uh, the eth uh, which is a very famous institute in switzerland uh, they validated all the uh, all the work you know and uh, what you do is very simple you just put water uh, into this plastic bottle okay? like our uh, regular you know you drink coke and uh, this that you know that bottle you fill it up with water remove all the labels and all you know and you got your water okay? now you you just leave this water you know out in the sunshine okay and uh, because of the uv radiation the uv radiation can penetrate through these plastics you know uh, whatever mi uh, minimum uv radiation you have in uh, in the solar uh, radiation okay and it can kill the germs okay and in fact you can see who has recommended this it is known as solar disinfection sodis okay as uh, uh, an affordable technology for uh, water purification so it is so simple to do okay now you can also imagine you know the things that we had talked about before that suppose i put in some reflectors okay over here so this is a tray and let's say i put reflectors you know so that it not only not only the direct insulation which is falling but also the solar radiation which gets reflected from the reflectors and falls onto the water bottles okay obviously with that i will be able to increase the amount of solar radiation which is uh, falling on the bottles and therefore it will be more efficient in killing the germs 
Okay. Now, where does your uh, understanding come in? You see, when we say reflectors, like I put reflectors. Question is, what reflector should I put? Like, if I put, say, they have shown uh, silver. Suppose I have got silver. You know, I've got a silver coating on glass. Then let's say I have a gold coating on glass, and I've got an aluminium coating. Now, what you can see from the reflectance values, okay, is that, you know, very interestingly, the stuff that is the cheapest, the aluminium, has maximum reflectivity in this range. There's virtually no absorption of the of the solar radiation. You know, so the reflector will do a great job of reflecting. All of the solar radiation onto these bottles, you know? and so this will perform the best if I want to increase and have a concentrated radiation falling on these bottles. Second, because the radiation is concentrated, what will happen is that obviously you know the the infrared component of the radiation in solar radiation will also go in and it will start heating up the water. And uh, so the water will also get warm, and because of the combination of heat, okay, especially when I'm using concentrated radiation and also light, okay, that I have an excellent uh, killing of the germ. But it's always, you know, it can always happen that these plastic bottles. You know they can have some plasticizers, some other chemicals. Plastic is never a pure plastic. You know there are always some uh, things which are used to make the plastic more uh, flexible, malleable. Okay, and so those things sometimes uh, can interfere and absorb the radiation. You know those uh, uh, things. So ideal would be that if you could do this. Uh, let's say in a tray uh, without putting in into plastic bottle you know? that that also would be quite nice you know? so for example you know this unit which we had designed okay sometime back i think uh, yeah you can see the us patent was granted in 2015 we must have done this work around 2010 11 you know or thereabouts okay uh, uh, in fact uh, Uh, Dr. Rajan, you know, uh, he is a mechanical engineer, you know, very brilliant at uh, constructing these devices, you know. And if you gave him a good idea, you know, he could uh, uh, take it forward. Okay. Now, what this does is that uh, the it's a flowing system. Okay? These are all you are filling it up uh, with water and uh, it's fine. But this is not that. You continuously flow the water. and the water passes through channels you know and the solar radiation falls directly on the water without any covering you know like a plastic what happens in a plastic bottle so one is that you get maximum insulation of solar radiation second uh, these were put you know in a slanted way okay so that you know the solar radiation as we have seen uh, depending on the latitude you know you you slant it and uh, let the water kind of flow in a slanting way so that the solar radiation falls uh, uh, best maximum you know in those cases and uh, and and also uh, then you put in these reflectors these mirrors okay to maximize the amount of insulation that is actually falling you know on the uh, on the uh, that uh, uh, capillary uh, groups okay so let me read out the abstract you know so that you have a better understanding of what it is the present invention of manually operated continuous flow flow type concentrated solar drinking water disinfector improves the effectiveness and productivity of disinfection of drinking water for individual families or small communities without using conventional fossil fuel derived heat or electricity or photo, solar photovoltaic electricity by clarifying and another thing whether it is this or that if the water is turbid put a little bit of alum you know 
and let all the dirt settle down you know so that you get a clear water because if you don't you know there'll be excessive scattering you know which you don't want okay so that's what it says by clarifying the feed water with alum aerating it manually so there's also some oxygen you know uh, which can help in the uh, degradation process okay uh, preheating it in solar water preheater and then while flowing as a thin stream exposing it directly to solar radiation without an intervening glass or plastic container material okay with solar radiation incident on top side of preheater section and on top side of solar uv section intensified with mirrors and while the disinfector unit which is mounted on a trolley is manually oriented towards the sun intermittent okay so so you know i mean uh, uh, that uh, this unit actually helps you uh, to both get a higher energy to kill the germs as well as the uv without any uh, plastic or anything directly falling on the roof you know and you end up getting uh, very clean uh, water you know a uh, germ free water uh, from this kind of a unit okay so all the time you know look for where you can apply your technology okay and nothing like uh, when i can use both the heat and the uh, photons you know from the solar radiation okay now this is another example you know where uh, there is no need to uh, 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 block off heat and only have uh, photons you know or convert everything into thermal energy okay i mean where you make use of both the heat and the light now it so happens you know that there are certain reactions like say this reaction okay, which is uh, nitro uh, toluene okay this is nitro toluene and uh, i can use a brominating agent okay and uh, then i can do a uh, uh, you know a, 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 a bromination over here at this point you know uh, okay ch2 br it doesn't brominate the ring uh, but it brominates this uh, position over here and you get the ch2 br this is an extremely important compound you know it goes in it, it's used as a protective group uh, in synthesis of many uh, organic molecules pharmaceutically active compounds you know antibiotics you know things like that you know it's a protecting agent okay now uh, what one does is that uh, you know inside this is the photo reactor okay again you can see uh, there are uh, mirrors you know so that it maximizes the radiation falling over here okay and there is a solar panel uh, with which you can also uh, you can you can put a magnetic stirrer you know in that and you can uh, Uh, you can operate the magnetic stirrer with the uh, with this panel okay if it gets too hot there's also an exhaust fan you know so you can blow air and cool it down you know in case it gets too hot okay and uh, then what you do is that you uh, uh, carry out you put all these things in okay and and the top part you cannot see properly here but you can also add chemicals you know from the top this is of course a glass cover and there's a thing jutting out from here through which you can add things you know so let's read this out laboratory scale solar photothermochemical reactor comprising a closed rectangular box with black absorber base and glass cover having suitably sized holes for projection of the necks of the rb plug resting on a magnetic stirrer glass reflectors were used to concentrate the solar radiation and a 20 watt pv panel powered the magnetic stirrer and dc fan okay employed for temperature regulation and stirring okay i mean that's what you are uh, doing and then you you get you collect all the uh, data like uh, this is the ambient temperature it was around say 27 28 degree centigrade okay the global 
insulation of solar uh, radiation you know this is what it was okay and uh, uh, um, your uh, reaction temperature this is how the reaction temperature you know uh, over a period of time especially as the insulation went up you know the temperature started going up you know, and you could reach a temperature of around what close to about 90 degree centigrade you know uh, with this unit okay and uh, so uh, what it does is that the photon you know you need a transparent vessel that's why a glass reactor because the photons are required in the reaction as well as thermal energy right where is the photon required and where is the thermal energy required well the particular reagents that were used you know uh, they generate bromine transiently now bromine with light gets converted into bromine radical okay now this uh, bromine radicals can go and abstract hydrogen from this methyl group you know this methyl group okay and uh, so uh, you know so i generate a br and then i regenerate my br uh, hbr okay and then once i've got my radical you know it can just go on okay because again it will react with the bromine it will become br it will again generate a br dot you know and the whole process kind of continues okay now this step okay uh, these uh, uh, these steps this step this step is the initiation step but these steps actually are facilitated by a rise in temperature you know so uh, this is a wonderful unit where the light is also used for carrying out this initiation and the rise in temperature you know is used to carry out the uh, propagation steps these are all thermal propagation steps you know so you can actually complete this if if the sunlight is good you can complete this reaction in a in a few hours time you know i mean uh, what 3 4 hours is enough and you can uh, comfortably make half a kg or uh, something of this uh, material and you can see it was being run from what about maybe around uh, say the temperature started rising here so around 11 o'clock you know and uh, by about uh, 13 means 2 uh, uh, hours you know uh, by 1 o'clock the reaction was more or less uh, over you know and uh, you can see uh, the the yields okay it's uh, 93% you know if you control the temperature okay if you don't control the temperature you know, there is some amount of side reaction that can take place and because of that you end up getting a slightly lower yield but if you control the temperature correctly okay like the best temperature was found to be about 65 degree centigrade you know so uh, you you get a 95% uh, yield okay and if you uh, if you cut off the light okay so suppose like let's say i uh, uh, you know i uh, uh, i i uh, i take a, uh, a a a container you know where uh, uh, it will only take in heat suppose i fully uh, make my glass uh, coated black you know with carbon okay so that only the heat will transmit radiate but the light cannot go through you know and uh, then only the yield is only 19% so obviously you know the light and the heat are both very important in this reaction you know and you can see a simple uh, way to do it so and and then of course you'll have to find uh, that how i can uh, scale it up into a larger scale you know and uh, you also when you are working on solar energy also remember that solar energy is intermittent you know you will get solar energy for 6 hours in a day but you might have to run your factory for uh, uh, 24 hours a day you know so what you might do is that during the time that you can run your factory with uh, uh, with solar energy uh, you use solar energy and uh, you know at other times 
uh, you can uh, use an artificial source of light like an led lamp you know and uh, so you know you can with the led lamp also you can uh, get a temperature of about 65 degree centigrade you get the photons uh, reaction time is 2 hours you know 88% quite comparable to the 95% uh, yield so it's not bad you know? so uh, when you are looking at also using renewable energy sources uh, look at the possibility of uh, uh, basically doing uh, both you know uh, have a backup you know of uh, regular uh, conventional heat and power you know as required when when you don't have solar energy and during the solar period you run your plant with uh, solar energy you know that might be the most uh, practical thing to do uh let me just uh, take you through uh, uh two more examples of uh, solar photothermal chemical uh, bromination uh, as i said i mean the advantage of solar photothermal chemical process is that you are utilizing both the thermal energy uh, in the solar radiation as well as the photons the light uh, uh, photons uh, which are there in the solar radiation you know and you need both Uh, to affect the uh, reactions uh, and i just thought i'll mention this because so many of you are from uh, pharmaceutical uh, 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 pharmacy background and uh, uh, you know like this is an oxazole derivative these have uh, very wide uh, biological activity all kinds of uh, uh, antibacterial antifungal uh, you know so, so there are many different uh, activities associated with oxazoles and uh, uh, this just shows a uh, a simple process uh, where uh, this was all put in a solar uh, photothermochemical reactor and uh, what it does uh, is that uh, uh, in uh, uh, when you have a bromine source it could be either br2 or uh, uh, it could be other brominating agents like bromide and bromide uh, which uh, in situ give you bromine okay so you can take uh, things like that and then uh, one of these hydrogens get re gets replaced with the bromine uh, this is benzylic bromination this position is the benzylic uh, position okay because it's connected to the phenyl ring this carbon okay and uh, so you get a bromination and then what happens is uh, that uh, uh, you know there is a uh, uh, there is a further a uh, reaction that it induces where uh, this carbonyl oxygen double bond c double bond o uh, this double bond the pi bond uh, moves here you know and forms a bond over here this bond okay and uh, therefore there will be a positive charge created here okay and uh, so the nitrogen uh, gives its lone pair over here so this becomes a double bond now okay this double bond and uh, then uh, uh, because now the nitrogen will be positively charged so you lose the h as h plus you know and the oxygen which went here it basically uh, joined the carbon and kicked off the bromide you know so it it uh, supplied the negative charge this oxygen over here and kicked off the bromide so you ended up uh, making this and the uh, uh, bromination repeats itself Uh, a second time you know and so you uh, you make this again it gets bromineated okay and then uh, you lose the hbr okay uh, if you add uh, an alkali because hbr is acidic uh, it will remove the hbr and this is the oxazole derivative you know so this entire synthesis uh, from very simple uh, uh, starting molecules uh, you can actually do uh using uh, solar energy okay let me uh, show you another example uh, uh now and and uh, this actually makes use of the parabolic uh, trough uh, so uh, we said now this is a line focus in a parabolic trough so this is your tube okay so what you do is that this is a process for making a membrane uh, making an anion exchange membrane so this is a polymer you know actually this is the polymer sheet okay and uh, it's a methyl uh, styrene based uh, uh, polymer 
okay so it's a polymer over here so what you do is that you can uh, you can roll up this uh, uh, polymer sheet and insert it inside this tube okay and of course if you take a much bigger trough you know i can take a trough which is much much larger than this okay in which case i can actually even put a meter uh, of uh, width of uh, 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 membrane you know over here and just it will uh, fold around and then you uh, pass uh, uh, chemicals okay and the uh, chemical would be something like uh, um, uh, in a solvent uh, you take n bromosuccinamide uh, which is a known uh, brominating agent and just uh, circulate it from here so it will go like this and again uh, get recirculated okay and from here Uh, uh because it's transparent it's a glass tube so both the photons as well as the uh, infrared radiation which is captured you know uh, which hits up hits it up and uh, the light uh, of course sheds the or gives the uh, photons uh, to activate the uh, reaction you know and uh, you can uh, see uh, a typical thermal image you know uh, so uh, Uh, you can see from this temperature uh, we are talking about a temperature of around uh, 80 degree centigrade you know or thereabouts okay uh, so you this is the tube you know, and this is a thermal image uh, of this uh, uh, unit okay and uh, and then of course uh, you must always uh, uh, note down uh, uh, what was your ambient temperature what is your uh, wind speed okay uh, what was the insulation Uh, uh what is the reaction temperature that you are achieving now you you work out uh, all those things and uh, make a list of it and uh, then in fact it uh, uh, did this uh, bromination so again like in the previous ex example there was a benzylic uh, bromination it formed ch2br okay and then uh, uh, if one reacts it with uh, trimethylamine which is ch3n Uh, then what happens is that uh, it forms a quaternary ammonium group so those who are familiar with chemistry uh, they will know you know that it will form a quaternary quaternary ammonium group so it will become like this you know so this nitrogen is now connected to this carbon uh, and the other three are uh, the three methyl groups uh, in the initial uh, trimethylamine and now naturally the carbon has uh, four valency so it will be positively charged and in the negative uh, compensating ion will be bromide or it is exchangeable so you can exchange it with uh, with anything you know and in fact uh, the, you know the the radiation uh, that you get and the penetration of the reactants is sufficiently good throughout the membrane uh, that the bromination is fairly uniform so this is a measurement of the cross section Uh, of uh, of the film so you can see across the entire width you know uh, how uh, uh, bromine got incorporated this bromine uh, it's not bad uh, in fact uh, it's subsequently been further uh, improved you know uh, and uh, it's been made absolutely uh, almost constant across the entire thickness and so this now becomes a wonderful way of making uh, an anion exchange membrane it was uh, much harder to do it before uh, it involved uh, use of toxic chemicals and things like that you know so uh, this is a very safe uh, uh, reagent uh, but it requires uh, light and heat you know for the reaction i mean and but then it's easy enough to provide the light and heat uh, through this kind of an arrangement you know and uh, you know i mean just to uh, show you that uh, Uh, it's it, this membrane has been compared with the uh, the international benchmark the best known uh, uh, membrane okay i'm not going to go through the uh, details uh, but you can see it's written anion exchange membrane solar you know so that's how it was uh, uh, produced and this is the commercial membrane and effectively you know i mean uh, it was uh, comparable with the uh, commercial membrane actually it was marginally better Uh, than the uh, commercial membrane so uh, it becomes now a technology you know i mean uh, if if one can do it uh, scale up all this you know scale up the trough uh, 
uh, scale up the tube, uh, everything. I mean, it's quite simple to uh, uh, to carry out these uh, reactions. And you could have uh, multiples of this, you know, so that you can do maybe about uh, what about uh, uh, say 100 meters square per day. Uh, you know, you can uh, produce. Okay, so uh, so that's the. Uh, in other words, you know, I mean. Uh, it is not just about uh, uh, just showing you some uh, hypothetical examples or or things which uh, are actually of no use, uh, only of academic interest is not true. Uh, this actually would be of great interest for people who are in green technology uh, that uh, do try and see uh, if you can make some of the conventional uh, molecules you know, uh, using this kind of uh, renewable energy and solar energy would be a, a wonderful source of uh, renewable energy and particularly the solar thermochemical or solar photochemical uh, processes.